The Chrysalids, Chapter 2 I reached home by my usual method, at the point where the woods came up against the side of the bank and had grown across it, and I scrambled down the side to a narrow, little-used path, and from there on I was very watchful and kept my hand on my knife. I was supposed to keep out of the woods, for it did occasionally, although very rarely, happen that large creatures penetrated as far into civilized parts as Wachnuck, and there was just the chance that one might encounter some kind of wild dog or cat. However, and as usual, the only creatures that I heard were small ones, hurriedly making off. After a mile or so, I reached cultivated land, with the house in sight across three or four farm fields. I worked along the edge of the woods, carefully observing from cover, and then crossed all but the last field in the shadows of the hedges, and I paused to look around again. There was no one in sight but old Jacob, slowly shoveling muck in the barnyard, and when his back was safely turned, I cut swiftly across the last bit of open ground, climbed in through a window, and made my way cautiously to my own room. Our house is not easy to describe. Since my grandfather, Elias Storm, built the first part of it over 50 years ago, it had grown new rooms and extensions at various times. By now, it rambled off on one side into sheds and storerooms, stables for the animals and barns, and on the other side into the wash house, the dairy, the cheese room, and the rooms where the farm workers stayed, and so on, until it mostly enclosed a large beaten earth yard, which lay to one side of the main house. Like all of the houses of our district, it was constructed on a frame of solid but roughly cut timber, but since it was the oldest house in the area, most of the spaces in the outer walls had been filled in with bricks and stones from the ruins of some of the old people's buildings and plastered mud was used only for the inside walls. My grandfather, in the aspect that he always had when presented to me by my father, appeared to have been a man of somewhat tedious, unrelieved virtue. It was only later that I pieced together a portrait of him that was more believable, even if it did him less credit. My grandfather, Elias Storm, came from the east, somewhere near the sea. Why he came is not quite clear. He himself maintained that it was the ungodly ways of the East which drove him to search for a less sophisticated, more serious-minded region. Although I have heard it suggested there came a point when his native area refused to tolerate him any longer. Whatever the cause, it persuaded him to come to Waknuk, which was then an undeveloped almost frontier country, with all of his worldly goods held in a train of six wagons, all of this at the age of 45. He was a solidly built man, a dominating man, and a man fierce with rectitude. He had eyes that could flash with evangelical fire beneath his bushy eyebrows. Respect for God was frequently on his lips, and fear of the devil constantly in his heart and it seems to have been hard to say which inspired him the more. Soon after he had started building the house, he went off on a journey and brought back a bride. She was shy and pretty in a pink and golden way, and twenty-five years younger than Elias himself. She moved, I have been told, like a lovely colt when she thought herself unwatched, and as timorously as a rabbit when she could feel her husband's eye upon her. All her answers, the poor thing, were dusty. She did not find that her marriage generated love. She did not enable her husband to recapture his youth through hers, nor could she compensate for any of that by running his home in the manner of an experienced housekeeper. Elias was not a man to let anyone's shortcomings pass unremarked. In a few seasons, he destroyed the coltishness in his wife with his complaints. He faded her pink and gold with his preaching, and produced a sad gray wraith of wifehood, who died unprotesting 
only a year after her second son was born. Grandfather Elias had never a moment's doubt of the proper pattern for his heir, and that was my father. My father's faith was bred into his bones. His principles were his sinews, and both men responded to their minds richly stored with examples from the Bible and from that mysterious book, Nicholson's Repentances. In faith, father and son were one. The only difference between them was in their approach. The flash of evangelical fire did not appear in my father's eyes. His virtues were more legalistic. Joseph Storm, my father, did not marry until his father was dead, and when he did, he was not a man to repeat his own father's mistakes. My mother's views harmonized with his own. She had a strong sense of duty and never doubted where it lay. Our district, and consequently our house is the first one there, was called Waknuk, because of a tradition that there had long been a place of that name there, or thereabouts, long, long ago, back in the days of the old people. The tradition was, as usual, vague. But certainly there had been some buildings of some kind, for the remnants and foundations had remained, until they were taken to build new buildings. There was also the long bank that ran away into the distance until it reached the hills, and that huge scar on the hillside that must have been made by the old people when, with their superhuman strength, had simply carved away half of a mountain in order to find whatever it was that interested them. The place may have been called Waknuk then, anyway, but Waknuk it had become. It was an orderly, law-abiding, God-fearing community of about 100 scattered farms, both large and small. And my father was a man of local importance. When, at the age of 16, he had made his first public speech by giving a Sunday address in the church his own father had built, there had still been fewer than 60 families in the district. But as more land was cleared each year for farming, more people came to settle, but he was not submerged by the new arrivals. He still remained the largest landowner. He still continued to preach frequently on Sundays and to explain with practical clarity the laws and views held in heaven upon a great variety of matters. And upon the appointed days, he administered the law as judge and magistrate. And for the rest of time, he saw to it that he, and all within his control, continued to set the highest example for the district. Within the house, life centered, as was the local custom, upon the large living room, which was also the kitchen. And as our house was the largest and best in Waknak, so was this room. The great fireplace was an object of pride, not vanity, of course, but a matter of being conscious of having given worthy treatment to the excellent materials that the Lord had provided. A testament, really. The hearth was solid stone block. The whole chimney was built of brick and had never been known to catch fire. And the area where it came out of the roof above was covered with the only stone tiles in the entire district, so that the thatch, which covered the rest of the roof, had never caught fire either. My mother saw to it that this big room was kept spotless. The floor was composed of pieces of brick and stone, with artificial stone cleverly fitted together. The furniture was whitely scrubbed tables and stools with a few chairs, and the walls were whitewashed. Several burnished pans, too big to fit in the cupboards, hung against them. The nearest approach to decoration was a number of wooden panels with sayings, mostly from the book called Repentances, that were burnt into them. The one on the left side of the fireplace read, Only the image of God is man. And the one on the right, Keep pure the stock of the Lord. On the opposite wall, two more said, Blessed is the norm. And another, In purity our salvation. The largest was the one on the back wall, which hung to face the door, which led to the yard, and it reminded everyone who entered, Watch thou for the mutant. And frequent references to these words had made me familiar with them 
long before I could even read them. In fact, I'm not sure that they weren't my first reading lesson. I knew them by heart, just as I knew the others elsewhere in our house. Things that said, the norm is the will of God, and reproduction is the only holy production, and the devil is the father of deviation. And of course, a number of others about offenses and blasphemies. Many of them were still confusing for me. Others I had learned something about. Offenses, for instance. Well, that was because the occurrence of an offense was sometimes quite an impressive occasion. Usually the first indication that one had happened was that my father returned to the house in the evening in a terrible temper. And then he would call us all together, including everyone who worked on the farm. We would all kneel while he proclaimed our repentance and led prayers for our forgiveness. The next morning, we would all be up before daylight and gather in the yard. And as the sun rose, we would sing a hymn while my father ceremoniously slaughtered a two-headed calf or the four-legged chicken or whatever kind of offense it happened to be. But sometimes it would be a much stranger thing than those. Nor were offenses limited to livestock. Sometimes there would be plants, stalks of corn or vegetables that my father had grown and cast onto the kitchen table in anger and shame. If it were only the matter of a few rows of vegetables, well, they were just pulled out and burnt. But if a whole field had gone wrong, we would wait for some good dry weather and then, and then set fire to it, singing hymns while it burned. I used to find that to be a very fine sight. It was because my father was a careful and pious man with a keen eye for offenses that we used to have more slaughterings and field burnings than anyone else. But any suggestion that we were more afflicted with offenses than other families hurt and angered my father. He had no wish at all to throw away his good money, he pointed out, and if our neighbors were only as conscientious as we were, he had no doubt that their burnings and slaughters would far outnumber our own. Unfortunately, of course, he said, these were people who had elastic principles. So I learned quite quickly and early to know what offenses were. They were things which did not look right. That is to say, they did not look like their parent animals or parent plants. Usually, there was only some small thing wrong. But however much or little was wrong, it was an offense. But if it happened among people, it was a blasphemy. At least, that was the technical term, although commonly both were referred to as deviations. Nevertheless, the question of offenses was not always as simple as one might think, and whenever there was a disagreement, the inspector of the district could be sent for. My father, however, seldom called the inspector. He preferred to be on the safe side and to burn and destroy anything doubtful. There were people who disapproved of this, saying that our local deviation rate, which had shown steady improvement over time, and now stood at only half at what it had been in my grandfather's time, would have been better still, except for my father. All the same, the Wachnuck district had a great name for its purity.